uh, during the migration, during the uh, the migration of, let me hit that, there we go. Um, during the migration of the birds in spring and fall, I was only able to see four different warblers, varieties of warblers. And I knew there should be a lot more because just down the road, they were seeing you know, substantially more. So I went to the Audubon Society and had them make some recommendations and then sort of give us a lot of information as to what we needed to do. It was about a two or three year period that we, we did these uh, different things, returning it to a more natural setting. And over the past three years now, I have photographed a minimum of 27 varieties of warblers from my back porch. And, you know, it's something that everybody can do. Um, it requires less work than you would imagine. And we'll talk about that as well. Um, I just returned this past Monday, a week ago, well, a week ago, Tuesday, um, from two weeks in Alaska, then a week prior to that, I was in Wyoming. And it sort of is interesting because the things that I've, I've sort of tried to not really preach, but talk about as to things you need to do when you're going to photograph wildlife, especially on a trip of a lifetime. Um, I learned a lot on these trips because no matter how much I plan, there was always things that, that went into um, little things were just twisted and little things just threw me for a loop um, and as, as well as the participants. But, um, you know, all in all, these things will definitely help. Um, there's not a spelling check on my name or anything at the end. There's no test. Um, live up in a, in a very great area of North Georgia where we've got all kinds of wildlife. Uh, this was out by the mailbox one day. The mailbox is about a half a mile away. Um, walking to the mailbox, we, we uh, saw this rattlesnake just laying in the road warming up and I carry my camera with me everywhere. So I did what I should do and take some pictures and then got it off to the side of the road. Um, you know, we're, we're really, uh, and I'm something that I'm going to try to really talk about is how important it is to learn the wildlife that, that's around you to become a better photographer. And even though rattlesnakes, you know, and copperheads and everything can be really frightening, they're an indicator species as to what's going on where you're at. And you can learn a lot about the different things out there by just getting over some of those fears. I'm, I still have a fear of spiders. I'm working on that as well, but um, there's just a lot out there and the more we learn, the better. So I wanna talk for a second about my gear. In Bear Woods photography, you know, in, in Bear Woods, you've got to have a bear that adjusts your tripod for you. Uh, this is a little bear that was up at the LJ Wildlife uh, Sanctuary. Uh, this is either Ben or Jerry, and we were ignoring him, and he decided he was going to shake the tripod until we paid some attention to him. So when I'm photographing, I break it down as to whether I'm photographing in controlled situations or I'm photographing in uh, the wild. And when I'm in a controlled situation like zoos or areas with limited space, my two favorite lenses are the 18 to 400 with my D500. Um, and it's an APS-C lens. And also like my Tamron 28 to 200 for the Sony cameras. And I've gone more and more to mirrorless. And I think you're going to hear from me tonight when I, when I actually admit that, you know, I'm almost ready to go ahead and sell all of my digital SLRs at this point, because I believe mirror, mirrorless has finally reached the point in my opinion, where it is as good, if not better than photographing with digital SLRs. Um, the big holdback for me before was birds in flight, but that's not the case anymore. Um, but these all-in-one zoom lenses really can give you great results. And when you're in a situation like Atlanta Zoo, where there's a lot of people around, you don't want to have a big lens sometimes that's intimidating. You want to be able to blend in with the crowd. Uh, the 18 to 400 was perfect for a situation like this. And just, of course, having cute gorillas, you know, doesn't, doesn't hurt either. Um, the 18 to 400, again, at a wildlife preserve uh, uh, nature sanctuary up in Holland, Michigan. Now, when I have more room to work, um, I, I didn't change this slide out on purpose because... Um, I added something to it at the end. Um, I use either the Tamron 150 to 600 G2, which has been my workhorse now for as many years as it's been out. And prior to that was the 150 to 600 original version. Um, and when I'm hiking a lot, I take that 100 to 400. Um, the 150 to 600 has just been an incredible lens for me. Um, I have, I've easily put several hundred thousand frames through that lens. 
um, over the years. Um, I've gone through 3D 500 bodies, so that can give you an idea of how many frames I shot through that lens. Still working great. It's, it's in semi-retirement over here on the shelf beside me. Um, and in a minute, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why. Um, but the 150 to 600 is just perfect. It's got an eight foot minimum focusing range or minimum focusing distance. So when you're photographing a bird, um, whether in a controlled situation like your backyard or like with these burrowing owls in Cape Coral, you're really able to get fairly close and control your background by compressing that scene and just making that background almost a palette of color. Um, if you've never been down to Cape Coral to photograph the burrowing owls, strongly recommend that it. it's, you know, it's a little bit of a drive, but just fascinating to watch. And they're not really scared of people. So you can get 12 feet away or 10 feet away very, very easily and not frighten the birds. Uh, this is out in the Kelly Warm Springs in Jackson, Wyoming. Um, just a, a beautiful, some, some trumpeter swans came in, the steam rising up, just uh, broke just enough to get the face of the one. And then I enhanced it a little bit with some dehaze. I took that dehaze slider the opposite direction and, and added a little haze here. Uh, the 100 to 400 is, if you are looking for a good lightweight wildlife lens, it is phenomenal. Uh, it's half the weight, it's just over two pounds, um, half the weight of the 150 to 600, half the weight of the new 150 to 500, but it, incredibly sharp. This was done in a D500, I mean, excuse me, a D850. And you know, with all those big megapixels, still you can get down and you can see minute details on the feathers of the bird. Uh, this was at the Teton Raptor Center. Um, just beautiful, beautiful bird to photograph. So my new favorite lens, the one that forced my 150 to 600 into retirement or semi-retirement, uh, the new 150 to 500 that Tamron just released um, about 10 days ago, actually, 10 or 11 days ago. Um, but I've had mine for about a month. You know, being an image master with them, you have a couple advantages. And currently it is only available in the Sony E-mount. Um, hopefully at some point it will become available in the near future in the R-mount and the Z-mount. Um, Tamron doesn't share secrets like that with me, um, but it would just make sense that they would be doing that at some point. Um, I use that lens almost exclusively, probably 99% of the images I photographed in, in Alaska were with that lens. And as you can see, I mean, incredibly sharp. Uh, I used it with three different camera bodies, the A7R3, the 6600, and the A92, and just worked flawlessly with them. The tracking was unbelievable. Um, and in, in a situation like this, I think I was still at a thousandth of a second shutter speed. But when you're, you know, you've got an 800 pound Alaskan brown bear uh, that is 10 feet away and then eventually got less than five feet away from us. Um, the bear's not shaking. I am, but the bear's not shaking. So the vibration compensation in it is just incredible. Um, for your mirrorless shooters, especially Sony, definitely check some of those out that are, that are out there now. It's a good affordable lens, 1400 bucks and just incredibly sharp. Um, these are some of the eagles in flight. Uh, probably my favorite eagle image that I've ever done. Just, uh, sat on a beach two different days, one day for about four hours, next day for about eight. And I just wanted to put the lens through the test to make sure it would do the birds in flight. I shot almost 7,000 frames one day. And the next day I shot probably 5,000 frames. And out of those, the, the birds in flight accounted for maybe 6,000. And out of those 6,000, I had a success rate of in focus at 95%. So, you know, that to me is what I've always looked for with the mirrorless system. Um, the, the cameras track better than the digital SLRs do. So if you're looking at photographing birds in flight, it's definitely a big advantage and definitely worth looking into now. Some of the other lenses that I use, the Tamron 70 to 210, uh, the old 16 to 300, and then I use the mirrorless version of the 70 to 300 because it's just good and compact. And when we were out on a boat a couple of times up in Alaska, I would have it mounted to the 6600 just so if I needed to, I could pick it up because we had situations where some of the orcas were 
15 feet away from us. And even at 150 millimeters, they were just too close to fit the orcas into the frame. So it was nice to have that by my side. Uh, this is not in, this is intentionally half black. If you remember Jim Brandenburg, he did a whole thing on wolves and he had the one wolf peeking around the tree. I've always tried to emulate and copy that image the best I could. Uh, this was up at the Lakota Wolf Preserve in Columbia, New Jersey. And that was the best I could do. And then afterwards I found out that he used to put peanut butter or fat, suet fat on the back of the tree and he would actually get the wolf to lick it. And as the wolf was keeping an eye on him, that's when he would take the image of the wolf with one eye looking around the tree. So this is a non-cheated version or a non, uh, I don't really think it's cheating. I mean, I think it's just an interesting way to do it. Um, but this is the, the all natural way to do it. Uh, this is with that 70 to 300 on a trip this, this past January to the Tetons. And I've really gotten into doing more and more environmental images with wildlife because you know this to me I could have zoomed in on the moose um, but I think it was just as important if not more important to include that background you know going ahead and, and backing it out to 70 millimeters I didn't really need to, to boost it above f8 because at 70 millimeters that's going to give me enough depth of field at f8 to go ahead and get the sharpness I wanted to get in the mountains as well um, like I said, I, I go to preserves, rehab centers, zoos, um, all those places. And for me, that is probably what helped me in a situation in Alaska, because uh, the last time I was in Alaska was 1994, maybe 95. And going up there is almost overwhelming. And you are... 20 feet away from 200 bald eagles. You're five feet away from an 800 pound brown bear. Uh, you're 15 feet away from sea otters. So for me, it was really important to know my gear and to get that practice before I got there. So that was the idea of, of doing that. Um, the animals that are at zoos and rehab centers, they're typically animals that have been injured and rescued they can't be released into the wild so they end up living their lives out as as wildlife ambassadors they they never put them in a situation that um, they're going to be disrespectful to the animals they're going to be harmful to the animals and my favorite thing about it is by going to those rehab centers um, or wildlife sanctuaries you find yourself not pressuring wild animals and there's a lot of controversy in the, the natural history photography world um, of photographing on game farms. And I have photographed on a game farm, the Triple D up in Kalispell. Um, before we did, we talked to the owner and we did an impromptu uh, just show up and get a tour of the back, you know, alleys and everything and, and see what goes on behind the scenes. Because I wanted to ensure that the animals in all situations were taken care of. They were treated with respect. They were treated well. There was no abuse going on. And I found out that with that one in particular, they were very, very good. And, you know, I, I would have no hesitation to go back and photograph there again. Um, this is the, the little bear that was hanging on the tripod. There was a situation, and this has been probably 12 years now. Um, these two little bear cubs had been orphaned. Uh, during one of the storms, a tree fell on a den and killed the mother. And some people that were going into, some loggers that were going in to clean up the debris the next day, heard these two cubs crying. They picked them up, took them to uh, this guy named Grizzly Silk that's up in LJ. He was, he had passed away now. Um, and I saw the story on the news and I contacted him and I, I said, you know, I would like to help you in some way, shape or form. I don't have a lot of money, but I would love to do some images for you. Um, it ended up I donated 150 eight by tens. So when people made a donation of $25 or more, they got a free eight by 10. And he also let us do some, some workshops up there where we took some people in there. Oops, let me a little. All right, I think our camera's back. Sorry about that. And this is uh, Ben or Jerry again. I don't know why my camera's been shutting down on me recently. Sorry about that. This is Gus the Golden Eagle. He was an eagle that uh, in the Teton Raptor Center, he had broken one of the digits, they, they refer to it as his wrist. And so he is not able to survive in the wild. 
um, but he is just a beautiful, beautiful bird. Uh, we go to the Teton Raptor Center and we do photo sessions with them anytime we do a workshop in, in Wyoming. And um, they, we do a lot of their promotional work for them. And in turn, uh, they bring out as many as 12 birds for us to photograph. So you're getting 10 feet or less away from, you know, a, a golden eagle or a bald eagle or a great gray owl. So it's really nice. It's good for them. We pay them a, a pretty handsome price to do it, um, you know, as a donation. Actually, if you guys know Jerry Black, uh, Jerry Black, myself and my teaching partner, Cecil Holmes, um, they were trying to raise money for a, a stand to put the birds on a perch. And the three of us got together and we just made the donation to them to get that built because we knew that, uh, you know, when you're holding up a six, seven, eight pound bird, uh, it gets pretty tough, but it makes it a lot easier when you can put the bird on the perch and the bird can stay out a little bit longer for photography. Uh, this is River, the bald eagle that's at the Teton Raptor Center as, as well. Uh, since this image, River has gotten much more of a white head. This was two years ago. So River has developed almost a complete white head at this stage. Uh, he's referred to as a dirty bird, but he's no longer really the dirty bird. He's got more of the yellow eyes and he's got less, more white on his head, less brown. Uh, this is one of the foxes up at the Triple D game farm. You know, I, I, and this is one of those reasons for me to photograph a fox in the wild, you know, I could spend hours and hours and I would be pressuring wild animals. And I'm really hesitant to do that because I don't want to be part of the problem. I want to be part of the solution. So it's an individual decision for people to make as to whether they would photograph at a game farm. But if you're on that fence, go ahead and do a lot of research. And, and if you find a good one, definitely use it. Um, this is a lynx at that same area. And again, the whole idea of doing these at the rehab centers is not only to, and, and, and farms and everything, is not only support the effort that they're doing, um, because Triple D does a lot of, uh, they do some of the breeding program of the Arctic wolves and the gray wolves that are being reintroduced into the wild because there was such a small population. Um, they artificially inseminate some of the wild wolves that are out uh, or specimens from the, the farm itself. So they do have a, a purpose that they use it as well. Um, but, you know, my whole idea of doing these is when I get comfortable doing this, when I do get into a situation where I'm facing a wild animal, I'm not going to panic. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I already have my settings ready. I'm ready to go when I'm out there photographing. And of course, to photograph a baby bobcat uh, would almost be impossible like this in the wild. So, you know, one thing that I always do tell people is, if you're going to do it, just be honest. Um, don't ever try to pass off a captive animal as, as a wild animal. Um, you never have to make up anything if you just tell the truth from the beginning as to where the image was taken. So back to my yard for a second. If you have the space in your environment, in your yard, it can be a back porch. It can be anything. You know, create an environment that will attract wildlife, especially birds, and you'll find that, that number one, you're having to do yet less yard work because the native plants that I'm planting tend to require less maintenance. Um, I don't cut the flowers off of anything. I let them decay in place. Um, and by decaying in place, uh, it attracts insects. And when you attract the insects, that's what attracts the birds. So I don't photograph necessarily the, let's push that button. I don't necessarily attract, I mean, I photograph a lot of the birds that are at the feeders. The feeders in my yard, you know, attract the titmouse and the chickadees and, and the finches, but the warblers and the vireo and everything else follow those other birds in. And when they follow them in, uh, they find different areas of my yard that I've set up, and you'll see some of these in a minute, and they pose for me in essence. Uh, we did have our yard certified three years ago as a uh, wildlife sanctuary by the Atlanta Audubon Society, which is now the Georgia Audubon Society. And we do host some people up here every once in a while. We've, we've talked about doing some workshops and stuff for like one or two people at a time. Um, but just with my travel schedule, I haven't been able to do that. So this is some of the reasons that, that I, I built the area that we did. This is a worm eating warbler. Of course, he's eating a cricket, not a worm. But the idea behind it is by having these plants in the yard with the insects, the warblers will follow the chickadees or titmouse or whatever else in, and then they find the insects that are 
uh, on these plants, the crepe myrtles in this case, which is a non-native species, but you're allowed to have a certain percentage of non-native in your yard. And what we've done is uh, we, we, can, we maintain and control that area that they're in. So that met the certification requirements. Um, and I've got an image, I think, in here, but in case I don't, I'll tell the story. Um, a book uh, by Rachel Carson called Silent Spring was the, the book that led up to the banning of DDT and some of the other insecticides and, and pesticides that were out there and even herbicides. And uh, it was an inspiration for a lot of what we did. But one of the stories she talks about was the Japanese beetle problem that everyone feels that we've got. Um, in the city of Detroit, they went around with airplanes and actually sprayed the entire city and neighborhoods with a substance to kill the Japanese beetles. And this is back in the 40s and 50s. Uh, but they told everybody it was okay, that it was, it was perfectly harmless. And they, uh, kids were out playing. Well, they found out that the next year, kids were sick and the Japanese beetles were back. So it did nothing to, to alleviate the problem. Uh, my Japanese beetle control up here are scarlet tanagers. And every year around the 4th of July, when the Japanese beetles emerge onto my bushes, I can have as many as 12 or 15 scarlet tanagers, you know, 15 to 20 feet away from me. And they're just beautiful to photograph. And they just, they literally gorge themselves on the Japanese beetles that are there. And, you know, I hope they don't get them all because I want them to be able to have some eggs and come back the next year. So look at the natural way to control things. Now, my area that I've created also doubles as a studio. And so you're helping nature, but you're also improving your photography. And this is what my studio looks like. I'm sitting to do this picture. I'm actually on my back porch. And if you look, you can see there's four posts that are around these little feeders. And you hear a term in the world of, of birding called a pecking order. The more dominant birds go into the feeders, the, the birds that are not as dominant go and they wait their turn. Where the birds wait their turn is on these posts or on the flowers. So as the dominant bird is in the feeder or you know the warblers come in, um, they'll be on these posts checking out what's going on. And when they do, I've got focal points in every one of them that I can just simply move it over and photograph whatever's on the post. And I drive down the side of the road. I carry a chainsaw in my car most of the time. Um, you know, it's kind of funny because if you carry a big drop cloth too, it really gets people worried when they get in your car and see that you've got a chainsaw and a drop cloth. So it keeps them entertained. Um, but I, I, I will find sticks after a storm. I'll cut them, bring them home and I attach them to a T post. And that's where I get my post for these, these different things. Uh, this is from my viewpoint. This is without all the flowers is in the winter or spring. This, I just set it up on a monopod and that's where those posts are. The birds land on it. And my job is easy. You know, it becomes very, very easy to photograph out in the backyard. The, the closest post is at minimum focusing distance. So I know that with the, the, the camera focuses at eight feet, seven feet, 7.9 feet, I have that closest post at about eight feet, six inches. And that way it's just outside of the minimum focusing distance. The bird lands there, I can quickly pan over, um, get it in focus and then do the images. The furthest post is about 12 to 15 feet away depending upon where I'm set up on the porch. So let's talk about in a second, we'll talk about the settings that I use, but this is some of the, the type of images you can get. You know, the black and white warblers just land and they're curious. That's all they're doing is seeing what all the action is around the feeders and they're looking for insects. Uh, tufted titmouse. The nice thing is, is my house is a very light gray. So any light that's available bounces off the side of the house and gives me those beautiful catch lights in the bird's eye. And it almost works as a, as a fill light as well. Um, bluebirds are my passion. And so I've always got a you know, the, the nice, the uh, nice idea of having the bluebird houses. I've had two broods this year. They're building a nest for the third clutch. So I should end up hopefully with about 15 bluebird babies by the end of the summer. And just love getting images like this. And I know that I've got a slide in here that says settings, but I'm just flipping through the hooded warbler. One of the 27 varieties. Okay, here we go. So my setting birds, when I'm shooting birds that are stationary, 
in your camera, you should have either like a group setting, an area setting, or a single spot focus. I choose the smallest point possible when I'm photographing small stationary birds. Same thing with wildlife that's very slow moving or very stationary. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm very targeted. I'm aiming for the face and I'm hoping that the camera catches the eye. That's, that ideally is what you want to be the sharpest thing in the image is always the eye. Um, I've got it in single focus. So when I push that down, I use rear button focus. When I push it down, it'll focus and it's not going to change focus again until I release it and then push it back down. And the reason I do that is because the bird can move just a little bit. And because I'm using single point, if that point jumps off the face and I'm in continuous focus, it's going to grab whatever's behind the bird. So I leave it in that single focus, let it grab it, and then I'll do the image that way. Um, shutter speeds for stationary birds. I'm starting in the morning at about 1 1 25th of a second. As it gets brighter, I jump up to 1 1,000th of a second. I'm in manual mode at F8, and I'm on auto ISO. Now, the reason I use auto ISO is the birds can move. And in, in the backyard, you've got highlight and shadow. And the birds can go from highlight to shadow very, very quickly. I'm not quick enough to make that adjustment in my ISO um, or my shutter speed. So I'm letting the camera make that adjustment for me. And I'm using spot focus typically. So wherever that point is focused, that's going to be the priority in the metering system as well. So again, single point, single autofocus, manual mode, F8 auto ISO ranging from 1 1 25th of a second at, at daylight up to 1 1 thousand. Um, now, the newer cameras are great at handling noise. And I have found, let me just touch this, make sure it doesn't turn off. Okay. Um, I have found that they handle noise extremely well, but recently I, I purchased the suite of um, Topaz, Denoise, Gigapixel and Sharpen. And the denoise in that uh, Topaz denoise AI is just absolutely unbelievable. Um, I did some tests where I was photographing at 12,800 and 25,600. And I was amazed at, at how great of a job that, that software did at reducing the noise and still keeping sharpness. Much, much better than Photoshop or Lightroom is able to do. I know there are some other programs out there um, that, that'll do as well. Luminar is one um, that does pretty well, but I just like the, the ease of the topaz. So if you're looking at something that you have some images that noise are an issue or sharpness is a little bit of an issue, uh, great program to go ahead. And the suite is like 150 bucks. Um, so it's definitely worth taking a look at the topaz. You can download it on a trial basis, try it for 30 days and then make a decision as to whether you want to purchase it. Um, another warm medium warbler, on the stalk of uh, sunflowers, just picking off bugs. Black-throated green warbler. So birds in flight. I have, I have literally photographed almost everything there is to photograph from, from NASCAR to the Olympics, uh, weddings, uh, portraits, you, you name it, landscapes. By far the hardest type of photography, in my opinion, are birds in flight. You know, you're photographing a bird that's unpredictable in its movement, the direction it's going to take, everything about it is tough. Um, but I have found that there are certain things that you can improve your shooting of the birds, you know, your capturing of an image. Um, and the first thing is, is change that single point focus to group or area focus. So the idea behind it is just like a duck hunter. Um, a duck hunter is not going to use a 22 because it's such a small round. You're shooting at a target with a very small round that's moving. Whereas with a shotgun, it covers a lot wider area. I know that's a horrible scenario to use, but, you know, I'm using a wider area to grab that bird and it keeps it in focus. The new Sony system, for instance, they've got a uh, tracking mode and I use the group tracking um, with the, the variable tracking uh, position. You can you know, it, it almost picks the bird out perfectly. And like I said, I mean, 95%, 95% success rate up in Alaska this time. So the minimum I will use on shutter speed, again, I'm in manual mode, auto ISO. Um, the minimum shutter speed I will use is one 500th to one 1,000th of a second. Even a big bird like a wood stork, um, uh, sandhill crane, blue heron, even though they're big and they're slow birds, 
there's a lot of movement, very subtle movement in the heads and the wings even. So when you're trying to get that eye in sharp focus, you know, you really need one five hundredth, more preferably one one thousandth of a second to get it. Now I do put it in a continuous focus or servo focus because the bird is moving. And if you do it in the single focus, it's going to lock onto that point and you can hold your shutter button down. It's going to stay focused where you initially did the focus. It's not going to track the bird. So you need to make that adjustment. This is uh, one of the things that I really talk about is I'm walking around and I'm birding. I will have my camera ready. I'll have it in one thousandth of a second, F8 auto ISO. Uh, this was in the Orlando wetlands. We were walking. I heard a, one of the hawks, you know, scream, looked up and I saw this red, red shouldered hawk flying directly at us. I literally lifted up the camera and just started, you know, got it into the viewfinder and just held the shutter button down. And I mean, every one of them are sharp from start to finish. So one thing that, that the hardest part of it all, and, and I can show you all the images are sharp, but you clip wings. So the thing to do is to zoom out a little bit to acquire the subject. If you feel comfortable, zoom in a little bit, but it's easier to crop and post than it is to have the frustration of always clipping the wings. Um, you know, a friend of mine jokes that lives over in um, Rome, he photographs the eagles at Barry all the time he works there. And he jokes because he said if, if he was Native American, his, his Native American name would be Clipping Wings. Uh, because he said he's got, you know, thousands of images that are clipped wings on the birds. So way to avoid it, zoom out, go ahead and get the bird in. And then, you know, as you get better at it, zoom in. But I could show you a bunch of images from Alaska where I clipped off wings. You never know which direction the bird's going to go. Uh, this is on a big canoe. We have a pair of uh, resident eagles nesting down there, and a friend of mine has a boat. Uh, the only way to access the area that they're in is, is on a boat, so we go out and we'll photograph them. And the birds up there have learned the behavior of the fishermen. When they see you hook a fish, the birds immediately dive down and they try to get you to reel in the fish really quick, knowing that the mouth of the trout is very soft and you're going to pull the hook out of the mouth, they come down and they grab the trout. So they've got you trained very well as to how they do their fishing. Um, you know, and, and when they first settled there, they, they started nesting on a place called Eagle Island. It was named that long before they got there. And they actually called me and they said, could you help us figure out why these birds are nesting on this island? And I joked and said, well, because you named it Eagle Island. I pointed out to them that they've got these automatic trout feeders that every morning at 9.45 go off and it feeds the trout. Trout come to the top of the water, they grab the, the food, and then they go back down. And I said, you guys have set up a golden corral for eagles. You know, that they're, they're just there to get the, the trout when they come up to, to eat every morning at 9.45. And my friend joked and he said, you know, he'd been getting out there at seven o'clock in the morning and he had never noticed that the, the photography doesn't pick up till 9.30 or 9.45. But he said the good thing was, is now he'd be able to sleep in because he didn't have to worry about getting up so early. This is photographed off the side of a boat. Again, this is another reason that one one thousandth is necessary when you've got a boat that's rocking and, and the yaw on the pitch of the boat. Um, you're moving, so that faster shutter speed is going to allow you to get a really nice sharp image of, a, in this case, a northern gannet uh, flying beside a boat outside of Jacksonville. So every once in a while, the light is just not there. And you can either just not photograph or you can try to create some art. Um, and typically what I like to do is slow my shutter speed down to a 30th of a second, maybe even a 15th of a second, and just pan with the bird. And one thing that I will tell you is when you start doing panning and even birds in flight, especially digital SLR users, a big disadvantage is, is that you're looking through the viewfinder and every time that mirror goes up and down, you lose sight of the bird and you find yourself jerking as you reobtain the sight of the bird. So if you'll train yourself to look over the top of the camera where the hot shoe is at in the back, and then you've got a white dot on your lens hood, if you use that almost like a gun sight, you'll find that your panning becomes much, much smoother and your success rate of panning with birds is gonna be a lot better anyway. So again, 
It's one of these things that it takes a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of frustration. Stick with it and you'll find out that it's, it's a lot of fun to do. And I did it with some black skimmers down in uh, Cape Canaveral um, on the beach, just panning with the birds as they flew by. I've always just been wondering how many times the bird hits something under the water and just like flips and rolls, but I've never seen it. So I'm, I'm assuming they know better. They're smarter than I am. Uh, this was an image at Bosque del Apache um, at the Festival of Cranes a couple of years ago. This is, uh, you don't see all of them, but this is just a small section of 5,000 snow geese lifting off at sunrise. So always be respectful of the animals, their safety and their space. There's, there's absolutely positively no image that is worth creating undue stress on an animal. And we uh, a workshop group out in, the, in Wyoming the end of May, and we saw firsthand how horrible it is to the bears out there to have these bear jams. And, you know, there were two to 300 people lined up on the side of the road, not giving the bears any way to get through traffic or anything else. And, and I pretty much made my mind up at that point in time that, that I'm not going to have any of my groups ever participate in these bear jams because it's number one, it's frustrating to photographers, but it's, it's more so it's frustrating for the wildlife. The bears in Yellowstone and, and the Tetons, the, the females and their cubs stay near the road because the big boars don't come near the roads. They stay away. So the females and the cubs have some safety. Um, but it's gotten to a point where it's almost more dangerous for the bear because of the people now. And there's a recently a story about Felicia, bear 863 or 53 that's up at Togwitty Pass in, in Wyoming that uh, the Park Service was getting so frustrated because of the traffic jams that they were getting me to put the bear down. And, you know, that's just, that's horrible. I mean, you never want to do that. You never want to see something like that happen because of the stupidity of people. Um, and so, you know, it's never worth an image. Um, this is bear 399 and two of her cubs a couple of years ago. Um, the rangers tell you to get back. Uh, these five people or six people, whatever were there, decided they were acting like they were walking away. Then they ran down real quick while the ranger was looking the other way. And they are two car lengths away from a grizzly bear and her two cubs. So it, it typically is not going to end well if the bear does get frightened. Um, you know, the rangers did see these people. They went and they got them all and they tossed them all out of the park. Um, I think that people like that need to be banned for life because, again, they're endangering themselves, the people around them. But in a situation like that, the bears are the ones that are going to be ultimately paying the price. Most of the time, they're going to be put down. And you just don't want that. Um, this is, you can see the people that were up the hill as the bears got to the bottom of the hill, they were looking up. But the cubs are still paying attention to who's on the hill. And you want the bears to be bears. You want them to be natural. Uh, this is 399, just strolling across a field, 600 millimeter lens, heavily cropped on a crop sensor body. Look at those claws. Do you really want to, do you think an image is worth having your face ripped off by those claws? You know, I personally don't. So a good rule of thumb, photographing wildlife, especially wildlife that can kill you, is welcome to nature where you step out of your car and into the food chain. And if you keep that thought process in mind, you and the wildlife come out better. Um, I personally would rather be walking down a trail, you know, making noise and see a brown bear ahead of me versus a female moose, especially with, with uh, you know, calves, because moose are one of the most aggressive animals there are. And a moose that's seven feet at the shoulders, you know, that's, that's, that can be a lot, of, uh, a lot of pain right there for somebody. I keep reaching up here just to make sure my camera doesn't turn off. Sorry about that. So just keep that in mind. Whenever you step out of your car, put yourself in the idea that you're stepping into the food chain. If you've been to Cades Cove, that's a perfect example as to how horrible people are with the bears and everything up there. It's, it's, it's a zoo, but in the opposite direction where the people act like the animals and the animals just sit and can view them. So always try to keep that in mind. Be part of the solution, um, not the problem. Uh, this was a wolf that was in Grand Teton National Park on Grovant Road. Um, I saw all these photographers that were gathered up and they were all pointed in one direction. Then all of a sudden I saw them all picking up their tripods 
and running back to their car. But I saw them looking off to the side and the direction they were looking was the direction that I was headed. And as I was driving down the road, I said, well, whatever they see is headed in our direction. And they were just off of the elk refuge. Um, as I said that, 25, 30 feet in front of me, this beautiful wolf crossed the road. Um, she went onto the other side of the road, stopped and looked back. You could still see the, the blood in her, her snout. Um, all those people that had all these long lenses probably were ready to kill me because I was able to capture this less than 50 feet away from a car, you know, so the, from the window of a car. Uh, this was a coyote just walking down the center of the road, uh, just isolating it against the snow and just again, heavily cropped. Settings for wildlife, mammals primarily. When photographing wildlife, I'll select a shutter speed based on the size and the speed of the animal. It's just like I select who I'm gonna photograph when I'm photographing bears. Always photograph someone slower than you when you're photographing animals that can kill you. That way you can, you don't have to outrun the animal, you just outrun the person with you. So from that idea, you also want to, and it just got dark in here because my, my light's on a timer. Um, I photograph, you know, a bear probably at the maximum speed, shutter speed that I would the minimum speed for a bird in flight. Um, a, a bear is not going to move as quickly as an eagle flying. So I know that I'm safe in going ahead and choosing one two fiftieth, one five hundredth of a second, especially on a tripod, uh, one one thousandth of a second if I'm hand holding. So the bigger the animal, the slower the shutter speed I'll use. Um, just, you know, and again, there are things that vary if the animal's running, I may speed it up at that point in time. Um, as a general rule of thumb, I will shoot in manual exposure, uh, F8, and then the proper shutter speed and auto ISO. So if you've noticed a pattern, I love auto ISO. We have paid a lot of money for these camera bodies, and we tend to not trust them to do their job. But with me, I'm a firm believer that Auto ISO is just like using aperture priority. It's just like using shutter priority. The camera does a great job of selecting a, an ISO that is going to give you a very good exposure. There are some exceptions when you're photographing in the snow possibly or photographing in a very dark area. You may have to add or subtract using exposure compensation. Um, again, exceptions are uh, using, you know, for exposure compensation is if you got strong backlighting or snow, in this situation, black horses in white snow. Boy, talk about a tough uh, metering situation. You know, here I exposed for the black horse. So I went ahead and I opened up a little bit and it also kept the snow in check. I didn't open it up so much that I lost detail on the snow. A bison as well. I'm adding about a stop of exposure compensation to, to keep that snow having some texture, but at the same time, adding detail to the side of the bison. So. I said that I did a lot more of the making environmentals in my wildlife photography. And a big part of it is me is, for me is from a print aspect, I do some prints and I do some print sales, calendars and stuff like that. I think it's important to show that wildlife in its environment. A close up is great, but at the same time, showing that environment sells your images, not only a landscape, but a wildlife image as well. Uh, this is a, a bull elk in Gibbons Meadow in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, this is, he's, he's, his name was Charger. He's bugling to keep other bulls away from his harem. You know, including the wood snag from the eagle. This is down in Fort Myers, Florida. You know, including a, this is actually a panoramic image that I did. Um, and it was two images stitched together. Uh, the computer did a good job of, of doing some guessing as to where the birds were and everything else, but it came out really nice. Um, this was from the trip to Alaska I just got back on. Um, I wanted to show the environment around the eagles, you know, how the, everything coexists up there. And here in this situation, we've got a tanker that's going behind the eagle uh, with the mountains behind it across the Cook Inlet. So just including some of that in the frame as well. An eagle on the side of a cliffside, that light just coming down. In post, I brought my exposure way down um, and just brought it so I had just a bit of light on the grass, but I really wanted the emphasis to be on the face of the eagle and that nice little leading line of the grass at the top of the slope as well. Uh, this is one of the grizzly bears, or not grizzly bears, Alaskan brown bears. 
uh, that we photographed in um, uh, Lake Clark up uh, outside of Chinitna Bay in, in Alaska. And even at 500 millimeters, this bear was a long ways off, but I wanted to include that beautiful sunset um, and the rim lighting around the bear. This was 1130 at night. And so it never got dark while we were there. Uh, it has totally messed up my sleeping for all of this past week and I'm still just trying to recover from it. But to me, I really love this image and, and it's probably one of my favorite images out of the 20 odd thousand that I did in, in Alaska for a two week period. I just love that little rim lighting around the bear and then the light on the, the hillside behind it. Um, I included a, a, a bush plane in the background of these two young bears that had been clamming on the beach. They were playing with each other. Um, at this time, the tide is low, the bears eat razor clams. As big as they are, they can use those claws just delicately enough to go ahead and open up a clam. A full moon with a sandhill crane flying over it. And a black bear sleeping in Cade's Cove in a tree. Again, to me, these are the images that always are my favorites from the trips because it, it reminds me of the environment that I was in and I was photographing. So again, always be part of the photography solution versus, you know, in the, in the ethics question, um, never have someone come up to you and say, hey, you were the problem here. Um, always be the example. Even if other photographers get really close, you don't have to be close. And I mentioned up in, in national parks, typically you're allowed to be 100 yards from a carnivore or a predator, 25 yards from bison, moose, and everything else. In Lake Clark, it's very different. They give you these, these areas that have logs that block off an area where you can be. You stay in that block, the bear decides how close they wanna to get to you. Um, again, the, it's mating season we were there. The females would use us as a way to protect themselves or to get some free time from the males. They would actually come up and stand behind us. And like I said, at one point in time, the minimum focusing distance on that new lens is five feet. And I could not focus on one of the bears that was there. That bear was that close. They're very, very mm -hmm. curious. You never get nervous. Um, you just talk to the bear. You know, you let them, um, you know, sense who you are. And, and you know, that you've, you've got a guy there that's got either bear spray. They do carry a firearm. Uh, with with levels of of deterrent they start with like a bird shot and rubber bullets um, and the last solution like the fifth bullet in the in the in the chamber would be a lethal round but the guide that we had in the 16 years he's been a guide the 21 years he's been going there he's never had to pull his firearm out the bears don't consider humans a threat they don't consider as, uh, humans as a resource for food so that's important so all this practice, the zoos, the rehab centers, the backyard, all of this, the idea is to create pretty pictures for you. This is one of the scarlet tanagers in the backyard that you can see on his mouth, all the little gooey stuff from the Japanese beetles. Um, just imagine having 12 to 15 of these in front of you in this beautiful light. Um, just it was one of my, my most special mornings I've ever had in the yard. Um, an Audubon's Warbler in, in Moose Wilson Road in Grand Teton National Park. A uh, Mountain Bluebird uh, by Mormon, on Mormon Row by one of the barns. I overfeed my birds a little bit. So um, I have to put them on a, a workout program starting every June. Um, we do sit-ups out there together. Uh, this is one of the little uh, um, white-breasted nuthatches that, that need some workout. Actually, he is just displaying that another, another nuthatch is in the area and he's making sure that he doesn't get his food. This is over at Carter's Lake. Uh, this is a perfect time right now to go to Carter's Lake if you would like to photograph the, the osprey. Uh, they're about to fledge in the next two weeks. Uh, you get about 40 yards, 50 yards away from them on the shoreline. Um, you can tell the juveniles are the ones that are in the nest that have the orange eyes. The adult has yellow eyes. The male osprey will not have a, a necklace. The female will have brown feathers on the bottom of her neck. So that's how you tell male from female and you tell juvenile from adult by the color of the eyes. This is one of the burrowing owls down in, in Cape Coral. 
This is down in a place called Kazan Lake uh, outside of um, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, a friend of mine took me down there. It's a crawfish farm and all the egrets and everything built in this one area. And you you can see some of the scraps back there that are crawfish. Uh, they have a great food source for them. But I love the hair on the little babies. You know, it looks like me after a really, really bad night and I'm waking up and they even have a crabby look on their face. Uh, this is that same area. There's a rosette spoonbill in Kazan Lake. All those birds nest and roost there. Um, this is a uh, this is down in Merritt Island. This is an eagle. Uh, he is not killing the coot. Um, I like to point out that he is the coot was struggling in the water. He went down, scooped coot up, took it to the shore, administered CPR, uh, mouth or beak to beak resuscitation, and the coot swam off fine. Um, you guys hopefully are not buying a bit of that. Um, that's one of the favorite foods of the eagles is a coot. And this coot just got tangled up in the, the grass underneath the water trying to get away from the eagle. And the eagle went down and grabbed it, took it to its nest as to feed its babies. Uh, this is one of the eagles grabbing a fish on Big Canoe. And these are from the in Alaska. Imagine being on a beach where literally you got 200 bald eagles in a 50 to a 100 yard span, if not less, 20 feet away from you. And then behind you, you've got another 100 to 200 bald eagles sitting on tree snags and the cliff and everything else. And, and that is what the coast of Alaska offers. I mean, just absolutely unbelievable. Um, I've already scheduled a trip back for next year. Um, I do these with Lisa Langell. Uh, they call them the magic of Alaska. Um, we've already sold out our workshops for next year. We're going to hopefully start posting and booking our 2023 workshops pretty soon. And they do fill up quick. We only take six people with us. There's a great gray owl on the Moose Wilson Road. This is the only great gray owl I've ever seen in the wild. And just an absolutely spectacular bird. Marvin, I know, has photographed the birds at the other end of Moose Wilson Road. This was at the, the end closest to um, the... the um, Teton Village side. Marvin always gets them at the other side. There's a trumpeter swan in the town of Jackson from the little bridge. Literally, you're 10 feet from these birds. So really easy to get some beautiful, intimate portraits of the, uh, the trumpeters there. This is a horned puffin. It was one of my birds that I got on the trip. Um, just incredible birds to photograph. Just seeing them was, was great. Being able to photograph them was just, I mean, a gift. Uh, and an osprey down in Florida, the Vieira wetlands. A little baby coyote in Tetons. This is at Berry College. If you like photographing fawns, right now is a great time to get to Berry College. Uh, this is when they've had all the fawns. You go to the areas between the dorms and the, the buildings right there at the front. Uh, the deer all take their, their babies there because that's where the coyotes don't go. So they're safe from predators there. And it's very easy to photograph some of the baby deer there. This is just between some of those buildings. Some river otters on the Moose Wilson Road this past winter. Um, and one of the little ponds there. These are sea otters in uh, Ketchumac Bay outside of Homer, Alaska. This was uh, two weeks ago, or a week and a half ago. These are some, some black bears in, the, in Teton National Park. You know, notice two of them are slim and one is black. Um, the mother will have eggs fertilized by several males and the baby's coloration can be decided by the way that the father looks. So if the father is a black bear without the cinnamon traits, um, the cubs will be black. Uh, if it's a bear that has cinnamon um, traits, it can also be a cinnamon bear. So these, this was last year in the Tetons. I had this whole moment to myself. This is bear 399 playing with one of her cubs. She may be fierce, she may be 25, but she still just plays with those cubs. These are two sibling uh, Alaskan brown bears on the coast of uh, Chinitna Bay. These are siblings. 
and they actually were following each other. They, they met up with each other. Once they recognized each other, they played with each other. This image was done at midnight. So that's how much light was there at midnight in Alaska. Uh, this is Blondie and one of her cubs out in Teton National Park. This is that bear I referred to as Felicia. Um, I think it's 863 is her true number. This is one of her cubs. This was two years ago. Uh, one of the moose, we, we, we do a workshop every year in the Tetons in the wintertime uh, for several reasons. The park is not crowded, but it's the best time of the year to go to the Tetons for wildlife. That first and second week of January, all the bull moose gather up together. They don't herd, but they gather together because the strength is in the numbers. So you can be in an area where you've got 25 bull moose in a group together with these big, beautiful paddles still. They haven't shed their antlers. If anyone's wondering, that hair that's underneath the chin is called a moose stash, or it should be. It's actually a dewlap, but we're going to call it a moose stash just for grins and giggles. One of the images I really wanted to get, this is a bison in the snow. We, when we do our workshop out there, we take over a, a dude ranch and this is in the driveway of the dude ranch. I love that snow on the forehead. This is in the National Elk Refuge on the backside. Uh, Rocky Mountain uh, sheep, bighorn sheep. It's breeding season. So he's eyeing a couple other of uh, the rams that are there. This is in the, uh, at the ranch, this is in the, the pasture where they feed the horses. They always get some big elk coming in to feed. And the way that you photograph them is if you're by yourself, they see you as a predator. So you get three or four of you together, get in a tight group and just walk together through the, the pasture. And they don't deem you a predator when they see a lot of legs. They think you're just part of a herd animal. This is uh, not a wild animal, but this is uh, a horse named Two Hawk down at Angels on Horseback here in Jasper. And I go down there and photograph the horses a lot. I volunteer my time. Um, but this day was really kind of special because, yes, I'm laying in horse poop, but it was a double rainbow above the horse. So even then, it is worth laying in just poop to get the image. So thank you, guys. Here's all my contact information. I saw that there was a couple little possible questions or something that came up. I'm going to click on that while we check it out. Um, when you take thousands of images, how do you initially sort junk from keepers? All right, that's from Chandler. So Chandler, I'm of the firm belief that I never delete an image. Um, every image that I shoot, I, I back up. When I'm, when I'm on a road trip, I carry, I don't have any of them here with me, but I carry three or four of these SSD drives. I back up every image to every one of those SSDs. Um, and then I will reformat the memory card unless I don't have, an, uh, if I've got enough cards to use a new one every day. Um, I do several passes. I, I, I always reformat my cards versus deleting. And that's what you need to do so you don't um, ever uh, corrupt the cards. But what I do is I go through and I do an initial pass and I'm still doing my initial pass on my images from Alaska where I, I go through and I pick out what I deem the best images. And I'll take an hour or two or three to do each day that I'm working on. Then after I've gone through every one of those, I go on a second pass um, to go ahead and start to look at other images that need a little bit of work. There's some grass in the face or I need to put a little work and effort into it. Then I make my third pass after I've done all those to see any um, hidden gems that are there. Um, but I never delete any images. So, you know, and part of the reason has been images that were throwaways five, six, seven, eight years ago. Now the software that's available makes those very much keepers, if not really nice images. So every digital image that I have ever taken is in a file cabinet over here on one of probably 20 hard drives that I've saved up over the years. Um, so I hope that doesn't confuse you too much. Um, so Mary Ann says, geez, I thought he was being a good Samaritan. I think you're referring to the Eagle. Um, he was really, I mean, that's, that's what I like to tell people. I've had people actually believe that he actually was trying to save that coot. Um, you know, <laughs> so sad. Um, Karen asked, how likely to see owls? I thought they were nocturnal. Okay. So, Many owls are nocturnal, but um, 
there are a lot that are diurnal. Um, you can tell by the shape and the color of the eyes on, on a lot of them. Great gray owls, barred owls. Uh, barred owls are primarily nighttime hunters, but they will hunt a lot during the day. Great grays are primarily daytime hunters. Um, so when you're out in the, in the Tetons or one of those areas in the Pacific Northwest, you tend to see those owls during the day. Same thing with snowy owls. They tend to be there during the day. So if they've got the brighter yellow eyes, they tend to be more of a daylight hunter versus the owls that have the bigger pupils, darker, darker irises, which tend to be nighttime hunters. So I hope that helped. But we always, we see owls every time we go to the Tetons because we go to the Teton Raptor Center and they bring out either a Northern Sawwet owl, some screech owls. Um, I just love owls. I've got several different families of, of barred owls up here. And so I get to see owls on a pretty regular basis up here in, in the mountains. So I think that was the last question. Um, were there any other questions that anybody had? Oh, there's one. Oh, thank you. That's, that's very kind of you, Chandler. He says, you know, thank you, wonderful presentation. So all of this is my contact information you see on the screen now. Um, I don't put as many YouTube videos out as I used to because YouTube has some really weird um, algorithms and they really pressure you into monetizing. And I don't intend to make money on my videos. I don't care about making the money on my videos. I, I want more to be informative. So um, I will post some gear reviews and some other things on them, but I prefer not to do them to, to make money. Um, my website has a link over also to the workshops that I do with Cecil Holmes. Um, I don't do a lot on Twitter anymore. Most of it is on Instagram and Facebook. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I get to